Justin Mogg. Oh, there he is. Hey, friends. That was fun. <laughs> Never parked it in here before. Now, I am no salesman. I tell you, I'm not. But what if I told you that I had right here in my pocket one of the most sustainable technologies available to us today? This little tiny device made mm -hmm. locally of renewable resources can single-handedly eliminate one of the biggest energy hogs in your home by using the power of the sun. It costs nothing to operate. You can own one for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Would you guys want to buy that? Sure. Yeah. Would you want to use one of these things? Yeah. You want to see what it is? Yeah. What is it? Well, my friends, the humble clothespin. <laughs> This is my 100% carbon neutral solar powered clothes dryer. <laughs> Available to each and every one of us today. Now there's another really great solar technology out there that you may not be thinking of. Can't fit it in my pocket, can't even bring it to you on my bike. But it is not only 100% solar powered, it's more than carbon neutral. It sequesters carbon out of the atmosphere. Okay, it can take our pollution and take it out of the atmosphere. It provides valuable services to us every day. It reduces the heating and cooling needs of our buildings. It captures stormwater, reduces flooding problems. It produces the single most important thing for life on Earth today. You're all breathing it right now. Of course, I'm talking about trees. But I'm talking about trees in a different way because we need to start thinking of living things like trees, not as just decoration but as valuable infrastructure, as a critical technology for our future that provides real value to our economy and to our lives. Trees also provide valuable wildlife habitat. These top pictures are taken right here on this urban campus at the University of Louisville where hawks are making a comeback. I don't know if anybody's noticed. And of course, our white albino squirrel is a symbol for this university. But you know, it's not just those creatures that love trees. It provides habitat for kids, too. There is no better playground in the world than trees. And as an adult, I love hanging out under a tree on a hot summer day, right? So we need to change the way we think about trees and start investing in them as much as we do our other infrastructure, our buildings, our roads. Why not? What could be more important? And you know, trees do another great thing for me. They provide food. This is what some people consider trash. This is the mess on our front lawn after last summer when the black walnuts did their thing. Most people, including the former homeowners, would look at that and say, how do I get rid of that? How do I get that to the landfill? We looked at that and saw opportunity. Here's an unused resource in our community. This is food. So we invested in another awesome human-powered <laughs> technology to turn trash into food, into fuel for our bodies. And as you can tell, I need a lot of fuel. Because you may have noticed that I got here today on another wonderful carbon neutral technology that can get people across town or across the country, as some of us have done, completely with our own power. No fossil fuels at all. When we get on this device to get around, we're not endangering anyone, potentially ourselves, but nobody else, right? <laughs> And actually, we're doing a lot of great things for our health. And we're saving tons of money. The American Automobile Association estimates that we, each and every one of us could save about $9,000 a year if we chose this technology over the one that most of us use to get around today. So why aren't we all on bikes? Why aren't we all out there building community, reconnecting with nature? There's nothing like being out in a rainstorm on a bike to reconnect with nature. <laughs> having fun. Why aren't we all doing that? You know, bikes, they can be used at derby time, people. Maybe now's the time to reserve your ride to derby on this fun device. They can also be used when we need to get something done. This is my plumber, Dave Berman. Gets around on a bicycle 
does all of his work on bicycle. He uses a neat little bicycle that they use over in the Netherlands all the time to get kids around, get kids to school. In the worst of weather, there is no worse weather for cycling than the Netherlands, and yet something like 40% of the trips are done on bicycle. <laughs> Even if you need to haul stuff, you can use a bike. This is my pickup truck. <laughs> you just attach a trailer to your bike, you can haul almost anything you need, including couches. Yes, we've moved couches on our trailer. These are a bunch of crazy volunteers who moved an entire office. We've done it for entire households, too, just with bicycles. Complete carbon neutral solution available to all of us today. So why aren't we all doing that? Why aren't we all using the bicycle and the clothespin? These solutions are available to us now. Well, to understand why, I think we need to go back to a different time. Because really, the crisis we see in our natural world, and the world around us today, I think is just a reflection of a crisis of the mind. And it's helpful to look at history to understand another time in the United States when people had a crisis of the mind. Historian Adam Goodhart makes a brilliant analogy in his studies of the antebellum South in the time just before the Civil War. And his analogy is that our use of fossil fuels today is just like the use of slaves before the Civil War. And why does he say that? It's not just because we use fossil fuels just like they use slaves to do the stuff we, don't, we care not to do. That's one analogy. But the other analogy is that people in the antebellum South, slaveholders, and many in the North too, textile industry was heavily reliant on slaves to produce cheap cotton. All those folks, were, slavery was so woven into everything they did. It was, they, their prosperity, their economy was so heavily dependent on this immoral system that they could see no way forward. How can we possibly live without slaves? That is exactly the state we're in today with fossil fuels. We simply cannot see a way forward without them. We're all so deeply reliant on fossil fuels for everything we do and for our prosperity. We also, of course, have a crisis of leadership. Now, <laughs> I don't blame Obama for everything. I think the Onion got it right on the eve of his election. I don't envy the position of the president. And I really don't think that any president or any leader is going to save us. We have to seek the solutions ourselves today. But leaders, just like Abraham Lincoln did, can help set a vision for the future without this immoral system. And in a recent speech on reducing foreign oil dependency, thank you for addressing this important topic. President Obama said, we need to invest in the technology that will help us use less oil in our cars and trucks, and our buildings and our factories. That's the only solution to the challenge. Now, I'm a huge fan of energy efficiency. <laughs> we got to start using less fossil fuels today. But my friends, that is not the only solution to our challenge. There are many solutions that can help lead us to a post-fossil fuel world. And many of those are available to us right now. And believe me, this vision of a future world is not one of drudgery unhappiness. There are a lot of smiles and a lot of joy and a lot of creativity in this future without fossil fuels. And I'm here to help share a little bit of that vision with you. And I have some secret evidence that maybe President Obama doesn't really believe this. We sent, we sent a spy down to Washington to see if this is how he really felt. And well, turns out Obama understands too. There can be a future without fossil fuels. Now once I get a little more air in his tires, he's really going to be loving cycling, all right? He's hauling stuff, too. I love this. This is a great shot. This is what a president can do to help us understand a vision for the future. And his wife has done a great job, too, with the organic White House garden, by the way. So I'm going to share a few more things of the rest of my time with you about what my wife and I do to live a new life without fossil fuels. And the first thing we do is we look around for opportunity, OK? So, we do a lot of watering our garden, cleaning up around the house, that kind of thing. And we thought, you know, why use fossil fuels to pump and treat water to, to get it to my house when almost all the time in Louisville, we've got this fantastic gift of rainwater hitting our roof every day. And you can take waste containers from industry that are otherwise going to go to the landfill or maybe get melted down and reused, hopefully, 
disconnect your downspouts and suddenly have a great clean source of water. We do it at our house. We do it right here at U of L in our organic campus garden as well on a larger scale. Waste turned into opportunity. We used to send this stuff down to the sewers where we had to use fossil fuels to treat it or even worse, send it out with raw sewage to the Ohio River and during a storm surge. We decided we don't want to participate in that. Simple disconnect from the system, right? Here's another simple technology available to us all today for very little money. Why do we use fossil fuels to truck the majority of our household waste to landfills where it's going to decompose in an anaerobic condition, turn into methane, one of the strongest greenhouse gases, right? When this is actually a resource, why not collect our organic wastes in a simple compost bin or pile and turn it into rich organic fertilizer that we can use to create the food of the future? That's what my wife and I do on vacant lots here, right here in Louisville. This is over on East Main Street. This is our little plot of land. We don't have enough at our house to grow the food we need, so we, com we, we garden in community with others. We take waste land that's not being used for anything. In fact, if anything, it would be weeds that someone would have to use fossil fuels to mow. We turn it into a place to grow organic, healthy, local food. You can't get more local than this. And look at what we produced last year on that land. This is the biggest carrot I have ever seen. <laughs> All organic with the waste that we used to send to the landfill. And if you think that's big, check out this nine pound sweet potato we grew <laughs> on a vacant lot in Old Louisville. Now we were not trying to win the state fair here, my friends. We were not out there tending it carefully every day. We're pretty good gardeners, but this is all organic, simple methods. You could do it today in your backyard or your neighbor's vacant lot, right? Even if you don't have access to land, each and every one of us can grow at least a little bit of food in a container. That's what we do on our deck. These are greens that overwintered. We don't have winter anymore. <laughs> so you can grow food year round in Louisville. Isn't that wonderful? And when you plant things, please plant some beans. Or maybe plant a nut tree. Why? Because three times a day when we sit down to eat and pick up a fork, each and every one of us has the possibility to automatically reduce our environmental impact by at least 10 times and completely eliminate subjugation and suffering of billions of thinking, feeling creatures. Simply by choosing the bean, the nut, or other sources of plant protein, and believe me, there are many, instead of meat. Now, I'm not saying all of us have to become radical vegans overnight. I know that's not going to happen. But we have the opportunity every time we pick up a fork to do something that will radically change our world. Maybe you start simple. Maybe you start with meatless Mondays. Maybe you go meatless mornings, all right? But do something. Start somewhere. Because you can make that choice to make a difference that will really impact our planet. Now, not all of us are into growing things. Not all of us can produce everything we need. Sometimes we have to buy some things. But when we do, can we choose to invest our community wealth in our community? If you buy something, Seek that local source, local products from local small businesses. We can, buy, we can choose today to buy from people we trust and we believe in to keep the wealth of our community in our community and to make our place vibrant, fun, interesting, and not like everywhere else. We can choose to do that today. There's another way we consume that I want to talk about briefly. <laughs> we were having a conversation with our neighbors recently. And when they started asking us about something they saw on TV, our blank stares must have given it away because <laughs> they said to us, now I knew y'all didn't have a clothes dryer, but you mean to tell me you don't have a television either? Absolutely. Our motto is more fun, less stuff. And I mean really. It's not just the couch potato aspect of it. Which would you rather look at in your spare time? This or this? Herod's Creek. What a great place to get out and enjoy. We as adults, as children, we should be out there enjoying these kinds of things. These resources available to us today for no money. And even our friends back in Wisconsin, I moved here from Madison, Wisconsin. Long, cold winter nights, what are you going to do? I guess you watch a lot of television. No! Snuggle up with a good book, or better yet, build yourself a little free library in your front yard and share your books with your neighbors. Why not? And. I just want to point out another carbon neutral, 100% human powered snow removal system, which maybe won't apply to Louisville anymore, but there are ways we can do without. 
Now I'm going to end here with another onion quote because I really think they got it right with this headline. <laughs> enough. Is it enough? This is the question of our age, people. Will just a little more consumption give us that satisfaction we need? Just a little more abuse of the planet and a little more destruction, is that going to get us to where we need to be? Put yourself in the antebellum south. Just a little more slavery. Is that going to get us to happiness and fulfillment? I argue that it isn't, and that what we need to do is start giving a damn. We need everybody to say, yeah, I give a damn, and I have solutions available to me right now that cost less than a cup of coffee. I can go out and do it right now. We have the means, we have the power to create a post-fossil fuel world right now. And yeah, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to happen overnight. And yeah, sometimes it's hard and you bike in the rain. But man, I have fun doing it. Man, it's a great opportunity to apply your creativity and everything you've learned, whether you're an engineer or an artist. You can make it happen today. Each and every one of us has something to contribute. And that's my challenge to you. Figure out what it is, dig in, do it. Let's all give a damn.